so good to have you with us. I mean, when I heard that Kerry was coming um, and over here at Easter time and he was going to visit us, we had to get him on stage because otherwise I just keep on crying in front of everybody every time I talk about it. So it's good to be good for you to do that instead. Good to cry, mate. It's good to cry. <laughs> so if you don't know, I, I'm a crier. It just happens. Um, Kerry, so we've been partnering with you. We've been taking up a collection um, over, you know, three years. Tomorrow will be the fourth year. Um, can you talk to us about what it is that you've used that investment for? How have you created freedom for women uh, with the investment that we've made in partnering with you guys? First of all, thank you. Thank you for your investment. We really, really appreciate it. Well, you, you got to see a bit of it on the video, didn't you? And there's more going on. Lots of stuff have happened since that video was made. We've filled that place up with brand new looms looms that you can't buy locally, things that are so much better for these women, so it's ergonomic for them, so they don't wear themselves out, but most importantly, so they've got that choice of freedom. So the thing's growing. Yeah. See, um, it was said on the, on the video that there are 500 women on the waiting list. It's up to seven now. We've got to build a whole new place. We've actually got to ramp this thing up. Yeah. And so your support is actually enabling us to do that. And that's just one of your works, because I know you, we're wearing the T-shirts that Freesia have. Oh, good um, t-shirt, that yeah, one. Yeah, the good T-shirt. You yeah. like it? Yeah, I like it. Yeah, not mm. too shabby. Which else? Cheating. So, here's the reality. It's just a problem so big. Yeah, you know? Yes, I... I mean, we've got 5,000 people in a room. Oh, can we really make a difference? Can we really change this thing? You know, I believe in a big God. And I think it's up to his people. That's us to believe in the big stuff that God can do. So yeah, I think there can be a difference. I believe that one day that we can walk into some of these communities that have traded in their daughters for generations and for them to say we don't trade in our daughters anymore. I believe that um, they'll be able to say that and, and do that and say that because actually it's God that's brought his kind of freedom, his kind of justice to their, their village. I'm looking forward to that day. I'm looking forward to, to sitting down with the village leaders and actually together, collectively repenting and saying, we've done this, but we don't have to do it anymore. You, you've been an inspiration to me, and um, I can't wait for tonight where you can be an inspiration to us all in what can be done. I'm just going to pray for you before That's we go. Fine. And Lord, tonight we ask your spirit to rain down us and disturb us with a holy discontent a discontent with the way things are and, and an imagination inspired by you to the way things could be. We're on the other side of the world to some of these issues and some of these issues are right under our noses but give us eyes to see and ears to hear and speak to us and call us out to actually change this world in your mighty name. Bring your kingdom. Amen. 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 So it, it seems to me that when it comes to pause in our lives, there are a couple of things that actually force us into a pause too. One is when, uh, well, when life turns to crap really, when it all sort of uh, falls away and uh, we don't have a choice but to, to stop because the direction that we thought we were going, what life was all about, the people that are around us here have fallen away somehow and we've got to take stock. This incredibly painful process there. And there's another way too, and that is when there's a revelation. A revelation, some kind of truth that actually says that we've got to stop, we've got to take a pause. We've got to reevaluate what life's all about, where we're going, what's going on. And for me, there have been a few occasions like that. And the first one for me, I'm, I'm almost a little bit ashamed to say, but the first pause, the first big pause for me through Revelation was the discovery that it's not all about me. That life doesn't evolve around me, revolve around me. It, it's just not about me. And I had to take stock and had to rethink the whole deal through. I don't know whether you've got to that point yet, have you? But it's just not about me. And then having become a Christian and uh, journeyed for many years, I had this, uh, I had another pause that was so significant that it changed the whole direction of my life. 
I got this truth, this revelation that the gospel that I was following, the gospel that I understood, the Jesus that I thought I knew, the Jesus that I was following was, well, frankly, a diluted, watered-down version of the real thing. And I discovered that because it required very little of me. In fact, in many ways, it required nothing of me. And so I discovered again that it was still about me. Sadly. It was still about me. How can I, how can I explain this? At the beginning of the Gospels, Jesus is on the Sea of Galilee and he's looking and recruiting for his disciples and there is Simon and Andrew on the Sea of Galilee and uh, they've been fishing and Jesus does this amazing miracle where they catch a lot of fish and now they're on the seashore and it was like I was right there with them just watching. And Jesus said to Simon and Andrew, come follow me. And to my amazement, with the nets in their hands and the job that they were doing, they dropped them and they followed. And then feeling like I was right there, then Jesus turned to me. And he said, Kerry, come follow me. And then I started entering into a conversation with Jesus. Well, Jesus, I'm really keen on this following thing, but can we talk about the terms and conditions first? Can we um, talk about how it all works? Because, you know, I need you to come alongside me. I need to know your presence all the time. I need to better have that real peace that you've got. But I think this direction is better. And um, Jesus, I need a few miracles along the way. That one that you just did with the fish was really good. I'm, just, I'm not after too many miracles, but I need some miracles along the way. And he looked at me. And he put his hand on my shoulder. And he said, Kerry, doesn't work that way. Mate, it just doesn't work that way. You need to come follow me. And by the way, keep up. And he worked and walked in the opposite direction. And it wasn't that Jesus was walking away from me. He was encouraging me to follow him. And I had a decision to make. Right there on the seashore on the beach I had to decide whether I was all in I had to decide whether I was going to stop negotiating with Jesus the terms of what it means to follow him I had this pause moment and I said I'm in and you know what happened I began to see things with great clarity I began to read scriptures in a way where I'd never read them before and begin to, I began to hear the words of Jesus in real, real ways. Where I began to grasp a whole lot more of what he was on about. I began to see that Easter was way bigger, huge in comparison to what I thought it was. I began to realize that it wasn't just Jesus dying on the cross for our sins and rising again. He came to transform the world. He came to transform the world in a way where it was just gonna, it was gonna grab some momentum and he calls you and I to the same kind of deal. He came to start a revolution. And then when I began to read scriptures in places like Luke chapter four, I remember feeling like I was actually in the synagogue 
when Jesus was preaching his first message there in Luke chapter 4. Like I was on the edge of my seat, just waiting for Jesus to come stand up and read, to listen to what he had to say. And he got up and he, he grabbed the scroll from the prophet Isaiah and he, and he opened it up. And he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he's chosen me to bring good news to the poor. And release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set free the oppressed. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And it was at that moment there in the synagogue listening to Jesus that I heard with huge clarity that that was what he was calling me to. He was saying, this is what I'm on about, Kerry, and I'm calling you to be on about it too. And when you get that kind of clarity, you can end up anywhere. You can stay where you are and begin to change the world there. For me, I ended up in Kolkata, a place that I never wanted or thought I would go. Moved into a neighborhood with 10,000 women trapped in prostitution for neighbors. Began to ask the question, What does good news for the poor look like for little girls who are locked in rooms, who are raped for profit every day? Freedom for the oppressed. What does good news for the poor look like for young girls whose mothers and fathers take them by the hand from the village and place them into prostitution so the money can go back to the village? What does good news to the poor look like there? Just two weeks ago, I was sitting down with a 15-year-old girl And she had rupees, money tightly in her hand, 50 rupees. That's a dollar, a New Zealand dollar. And she just had a customer having come into the area at 15 years old, and that was her money for food for the night. I said to her, can you go back home? And then she began to show me her scars and she said, but they beat me. My father beats me. And she pulled back her hair and showed me a huge scar there and then on her arms and on her legs. She says, my family and my community tell me I'm such a bad girl that this is the place for me. What does freedom look like for her? What does freedom look like for girls that have been married off at 10 years old and then get thrown out on the street later on with their children and are forced to sell themselves so they can feed their children? Good news for the poor. I've got a great friend and she works at Freeset Fabrics the video that you've just seen. I've known her for 10 years. And she's worked the street of Sonagachi for a long time, as you know. And, and she was trafficked by her own father when she was 16 years old. And we became good friends. And I'd meet her lots and lots of times and we would have cups of tea together and we would talk freedom and I would always encourage her to come to Freeset and for 10 years 
She never came. She couldn't get the courage. She couldn't feel as though, she wasn't able to feel as though she had, was able to make that kind of choice to take the freedom step. We were friends, but there wasn't any freedom. And then one day, I was in Mashidabad in Valkundi where Freeset Fabrics is, and I heard that she had gone home. And she lives in a little mud hut with her, her mother when she's there, and it's a, it's a very sort of falling down little hut. And so Mina from Freeset and I, we went to visit her, and we tried again. And I said to her, Freeset Fabrics is just down the road. You never have to go back to Sonagachi again. You can stay here, and here you will find your freedom. And that afternoon, she went down to Freeset Fabrics with her mother, stayed the whole afternoon. And she started at Freeset Fabrics the next day. Ten years. And it was worth it to see her find freedom. When I go and see her, when I go and visit her, she comes up to me and she's only about this high and she wraps her arms around me and she calls me Baba, Father, Dad. And then she points in the direction that she thinks Sonagachi is, the red light district in Kolkata, and she just goes like this. Never going back. Never going back. Just a few months ago, I went to Freeset Fabrics and there was a new woman there. And I recognized her. She was from the brothel where my friend had come from. And she had brought and talked with this girl and this new girl had joined from Sonagachi and come back as well. And so there was freedom for her as well. And then I thought to myself, I wonder whether she's got already that it's not about her. Even though she could rightly say for years she was raped and abused, sold into a sex kind of slavery, she didn't say it's just about me. She was starting to get it. Then I went back again and I discovered there were two more women from Sonagachi and she had a hand in that as well. And she was starting to gather and is starting to gather other women from her brothel around her because she's realized it's not about her. And I've begun to wonder this. Has she been having a conversation with Jesus on the beach too? Has she been having a conversation where Jesus has said, come follow me so early in the peace? And she's starting to say, yeah, I'm in. A woman sold into slavery when she was 16 years old. And already she's beginning to get that it's not about her. That it is good news for the poor. That it is release to the captives and it is recovery to sight to the blind. And it is freedom for the oppressed. Do you know you only get to make <laughs> and see with great clarity when you make that decision on the beach with Jesus? Someone said to me, <laughs> so what did you put on hold? Everything. 
Isn't that what he calls us to do? To throw our lot in with him. So that's the question I have for you tonight. Talking with Jesus on the beach. And Jesus saying to you, come follow me. What kind of conversation are you having? Are you all in? Because that's where you get the clarity. That's how you get to do a pause. That's where the good news for the poor is. We start following the one who wants to bring justice and righteousness to our world. As blue comes up, we're going to pray. There are some here that are asking that question now. I really believe that. Father, some of us have followed you for years. And we come to this moment and ask this question about how much you have required of us.